It's uh, fantastic to be back in the Dead Sea. Uh, it's probably my fifth event here uh, uh, in Jordan for the World Economic Forum. And I am particularly uh, satisfied that we were able to put together a, such a diverse group of members from the, uh, the energy sector and even the geopolitical uh, front as well. We have the uh, president of Armenia. You can look at your program, and I'm sure it's going to be flashing on the screen. Uh, the Minister of Petroleum and Mineral Resources in Egypt and diversity. We, we have CEO from Renewables uh, for GE in the Middle East, Africa, and Turkey. Ben it's nice to see you. Patrick represents a gas producer based out of Dubai, or in the UAE, rather, uh, Dana Gas. And uh, Win Energy with Lee King uh, serving on the CEO is one of our startup companies that's joining us from the UK uh, in Dubai. Let's give him a warm welcome for the uh, session. If the debate is anything like we had in the green room, we're going to be in great shape. <laughs> uh -huh. Because as uh, diverse as this group is that we brought to the table, so are the opinions of where we're going uh, first. I, I want to bring up a slide to, to start our debate, and that is on uh, demand from now until 2040. Uh, it's a, a slide from the International Energy Agency. If we can bring that up, please. That'd be great. It lays out different scenarios here, as you can see. Uh, scenarios to 2040. Uh, this was put out in 2016 and has remained continuous for the last couple of years. Uh, we are at, uh, as Patrick knows, just below 100 million barrels a day now. And under the three different scenarios that the IEA is laying out, because of what we see in terms of investments in the renewable arena, uh, we could have uh, demand rise to 120 million barrels a day. Uh, in the new policy scenario and the pace of investment you see today, uh, kind of leveling off at about 100 million barrels a day, or quite a, a U-turn here going below 80 million barrels a day, trying to hit the targets uh, of the COP agreement and keeping the global heating of the world below two uh, degrees. What I want to start with, and this is not where we're going to finish, but I'd love to have the president of Armenia uh, jump, in, jump in here, uh, Dr. Sarkeesian. Uh, what are the implications of world oil demand dropping perhaps uh, to 80 or below that on a country like Russia, a country like Saudi Arabia? Are they ready for the transition themselves as we move away from hydrocarbons, oil and gas uh, to a more renewable mix going forward? There are implications. Uh, you, you have a book coming out that kind of deals with the uncertainties of uh, today's society. Does it play out here also as we see the transition in energy come to the fore? Well, transition in energy, of course, is a part of the global transition. What is happening now, and it's, it's the right place to speak about the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution will have huge impact on what is happening here in the world. And one of the scenarios, I, I prefer to have the green one, which uh, looks much more sort of a nicer for the world population. Why, because it's more even keeled is what I mean, you're suggesting? Exactly. Yeah. But the fourth industrial revolution is accompanied much more revolutionary uh, processes here. I call them our evolution, revolutionary evolution. Basically, the fourth industrial revolution is not an evolution when you have evolution, then revolution, another evolution, another revolution, and the fourth one. It will be exponential growth of many things. And as we heard today as well, it will be also a merger of bi biology, technology, energy, and politics as well. So what will change all, all change in, in this world is not only the new technology, how much, uh, which type of energy we are using, but also the way we are managing it, technologically and politically. And from that point of view, the risks that we are facing are going to be not the classical ones that we know. I mean, you go back 30, 40 years or 50 years ago, the political risks that we were facing the world was divided between two empires. At the end, of it, there was a competition. There were risks related to this war or that war. That's what could be predicted, and the oil prices was jumping up or jumping down. That's what the, mm. the reality is that any risk is connected with predictability. The higher predictability, the lower is the risk. And the predictability has many components. It has uh, industrial, economic, macroeconomic, and so on, but the one of them is, is political as well. The political risks, <laughs> if you go back another 20, 30 years, were classical risks. What could have been guessed or accounted, and, or the, and in many forms, there was about cooperation or non-cooperation between states, nations, their interests, and so on and so forth. The new world is a world of a quantum behavior. 
I think the small gadget that each of us has and has not brought here in order to is our life, our information, our family, our archive, our accounting, our credit card, and so on and so on, but also a new way of participating in politics. I think that this po political movement worldwide is by becoming more and more quantum at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Look what was happening in many places of the world. I mean, the election of a young, talented politician in France just a couple of years ago was a quantum effect when addressing to the people was not through traditional institutions, the political party, the organization, but directly to the public. And they are interacting. It's not only that they are voting only four or five years once, but they are involved in this process every day by, through the Facebook or Twitter and so on. The quality of exchange of information has changed as well. Let's go back 60, 70 years ago, I mean, when radio was first used by presidents of let's say, the United States and later in Europe and further down as a way of communication. Then the television, CNN. And, and President Kennedy was one of the first to use that power. And then you go further down, President Obama and then President Trump, mm. addressing directly to the people. He is involved in direct dialogue with people every day through his Twitter. Well, let's, so let's bring it back to energy, though. So we see, uh, Minister Amole, that uh, the president decides to intervene when it comes to OPEC and non-OPEC uh, policy. Now, one would argue, and I think this is a good point of debate for the rest of the panelists, what OPEC and non-OPEC players are trying to do is provide predictability, to Dr. Sarkeesian's point, $65, $70 a barrel based on demand, which provides stability also for investment in the renewable space. Uh, is this disruption coming from what we see in Brexit or from the United States actually not benefiting this energy transition that we're all faced with today? What do you think? No, I think this is what each party would like to see. I mean, this is the balance that is needed really globally. I mean, um, the, 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 the fair price uh, between the producers and the consumers on which uh, the investments will be based on. So uh, if we talk about renewables, and even if we talk about upstreamers in oil and gas, and if we talk about strategies that uh, different governments would like to adopt, they need to see and to forecast what will be the, uh, the oil prices. So uh, this, uh, this idea of OPEC is uh, with the intention of really giving the impressions and the good uh, messages to the market, and to global markets, that we are stable, they, the OPEC, uh, and we can give you the reassurance of your investments. Based on that, you can then build the, uh, the renewables uh, industry. By which, coming back to your first question, if I would tie both to them, mm -hmm. uh, each of the major oil producers are going major renewables uh, programs. So they do not want to, uh, uh, to rely on one source of energy, plus they want to diversify their GDP. So accordingly, uh, I mean, this renewable uh, uh, mission is always of interest and attraction to major oil producers as well. Uh, hence, I think that ultimately, the entire world has got the same strategy, but the idea is how and how fast this would be implemented, because ultimately, this is what OPEC wants. Perhaps, as you mentioned, this is not going at the same pace of what, if I would say, what President Trump is, is asking. Uh, however, uh, the idea is how to synchronize the pace of both uh, to be uh, timely. Um, I think at the end of the day, there is no doubt that the entire world has got the same uh, objectives. If we talk about uh, uh, availing the, uh, the energy resource, at the same time, keeping the environment uh, uh, strategies. They can run in uh, parallel. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, good. Let's yeah. bring in Menard to get your thoughts on this. And this price of $65 a barrel, $70 a barrel, which we've been in this bandwidth, and Patrick, you can jump in on this as well. Yeah. Uh, is it helping renewable investment? I, I saw the tipping point in 2017 where investments into renewable power generation surpassed oil and gas uh, for two years running. Was it significant for you when you saw this? as a, a uh, beginning of a permanent transition? Absolutely, and specifically in our region, if we speak about it. 
as an example, as His Excellency mentioned, this region is blessed with a bond of resources. When you speak about the oil and gas, when you speak about the sun, when you speak about the wind. So the question today, as His Excellency mentioned, is that transition, energy transition, and moving from a fossil fuel-based economy into more of a renewable-based economy, and how can that play a role? Today, I don't believe that we're going to see less resources and less usage of oil and gas in the region. However, is how can we use them for more value add? Mm. You know, what kind of industries and diversification? And maybe for the electricity generation, you're going to focus primarily on renewable. Today, you know, this fluctuation in oil price have actually caused a bit of instability for both oil importers as well as oil exporters. If you look at uh, oil importers in 2010 to 14, when you had uh, oil prices of nearly $140 per barrel, that caused a major issue for them and their economies. Countries like Jordan, that today nearly 97% of their electricity, their burning fuels that they import, it cost them around $3 billion annually. Lebanon equally, $3.1 billion. Morocco, $9 billion. That caused a lot of pressure and that would push them to actually focus into renewable. Equally said, oil exporter countries in 2015 to 17, where oil prices went from 140 to $30, that caused a major fiscal deficit in their economy that they were planning for. So the question now, this instability and volatility caused a lot of disruption. How can they focus on actually having a bit of a clear outlook? How can they utilize their natural resources more efficiently? as well as how can they have the right electricity production. Having said that, and I think Sir Patrick would agree with me, it's the fact that I don't think so fossil fuel is disappearing. On the contradictory, it's actually finding the balance between renewable and fossil in the years to come. The demand for energy and electricity is increasing. It's actually tripling in our part of the world. And that's driven by everything. It's driven by urbanization, economic growth, population growth, industrialization, as well as electrification, mm. if you look at it. So if you just take two minutes to think, the kind of energy sector that we will have in the next five and 10 years is going to be completely different than what you see today. Good. If we can bring the slide back up on the oil demand, I'm going to have Patrick weigh in here. Uh, do the Middle East players uh, win this game if there's still 80? 90 or 100 million barrels a day, it's the low cost producer that will survive and prevail. This is the reality. And perhaps, and I've seen the estimates that by 2025, maybe 2030, that U.S. output begins to uh, level off because they're going full throttle on shale uh, today. So in a scenario, say the new policy scenario, at 100 million barrels a day, the low cost producer wins this. And I think to Menard's point, they're looking to go downstream into the petrochemical space as well with this higher value add. I think, John, that's a question of time and scale, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the local uh, producers, particularly in this part of, the, part of the world, in the Middle East, they're the lowest cost producers. Ultimately, they'll win that, they will win out. The, 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 the problem that the, the countries of the Middle East, the, the, the oil exporters face, is that their fiscal break-even costs are, of course, much higher. Because yeah. their economies are predominantly uh, based around uh, oil exports. So whilst they're the lowest cost producer, $20, $30 a barrel. The fiscal break-even cost for a country like Saudi Arabia has come down a lot. It used to be over $100. Now it's probably closer to 80 Well, it's creeped up but, again. So about 93 in the latest budget. I so, uh, yeah. So it, no, it, it is, that's, that's the struggle, of course, for the, for the countries in the region. But if you want to think a little bit about energy transition and the trends, I think you, you can use the UAE as a great example of how uh, even a major oil, uh, oil exporter such as the UAE, how they are changing their energy balance going forwards and with their 2030 vision. At the moment, power generation in the UAE is predominantly gas powered, so it's about 80%. Uh, but by 2030, they're going to try and reach a 50-50 balance of, uh, of gas for 50 uh, and uh, renewables for 50. That will be some nuclear, but predominantly it's going to be uh, solar PV. And the, the huge drive that has gone into expanding solar PV in the UAE through the auction process has brought uh, prices, solar PV prices, right down. The, the last bid that I saw was 35 uh, US dollar cents per kilowatt hour. Now, if you turn that into a gas equivalent price, that's probably around $4 uh, per, per, per million BTU uh, gas price. So mm -hmm. that's making solar PV very competitive against uh, you know, a, a usual range of gas prices uh, in the region. 
good. Lee King, uh, yeah. what do you need to happen in uh, the wind uh, power area for this to be much more pervasive? You talked about storage. <coughs> I've seen the level of investment going into storage. You talk about dispatchable fuel as well to have predictability. Yeah. Uh, share for how this applies to the Middle East. I think um, in, in order for the um, energy transition to happen, you have to outcompete fossil fuels um, in terms of cost, uh, in terms of power density, energy density, and scalability. I mean, fossil fuels are amazing. You know, in such a small amount of space, you have so much power and energy density. Um, so it, it's important, and th the only way that I can see it happening is if we solve the grid-scale energy storage problem um, to absorb the volatility uh, and uh, sorry, the volatility and the sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Mm -hmm. No, the, the volatility, predictability, uh, the volatility, think, right? and sorry, the intermittency yes. of renewables. Yes, uh, but it has to be grid-scale. So it has to be something very similar to pumped hydro. Okay, very good. So, John, can I just jump in there Please, as well? Please, yeah. I, mean, I think that, again, in the UAE example, um, you know, whilst they're bringing down gas in the uh, power generation mix, uh, gas is going to continue to play a really important role in providing that uh, backup uh, system for the intermittency of supply from solar PV, for example, because clearly the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day. So you have to find a way of providing the power that people need to consume 24 hours a day. And having gas, particularly uh, CCGT gas, is a great way of combining with renewables in order to be able to provide that 24-hour uh, supply. You know, in CGTV, you're, you're talking about uh, CG, CCGT CCGT as carbon combined capture. Cycle gas. Yeah, exactly. Combined cycle gas uh, technology. Okay, CCGT. good. Because there's a lot of money going to carbon capture at this stage as well. Not as much as uh, I think we should if we're going to try and meet our COP21 targets. But clearly, uh, you know, one of the one of the things, if, if, if your driver is CO2 and to, to bring down CO2 production, one of the major uh, efforts that's got to go on worldwide is to take coal out of the power generation mix. Currently, 40% of power generation is still coal. Uh, it's the dirtiest. It's the, it's the single largest source of, uh, of uh, CO2 production on the planet. Uh, replacing coal with, for example, gas and renewables is going to be the quickest and cleanest and I think cheapest win in terms of hitting our climate target. Good, I want to circle back to gas in a second, but Menard, can you weigh in on the, the role of the Chinese setting the market for solar panels uh, <laughs> and the grid, for example? Uh, Lee was talking about the need to modernize the grid, the Chinese are doing it, but at the same time, they're huge users of coal yeah. and they've got a lot uh, to burn through. So how do they balance the two? How do you watch it as a renewable CEO for GE? So the way that they're looking at it, uh, you know, a few years ago, the question was, can renewable be competitive? You know, as an example, I used to remember when I had the discussion in this part of the world, and I used to say renewable, the discussion would end in a nanosecond. No one was interested because solar was eight times more expensive and wind was 12 times more expensive. It just didn't make sense. In today's world, everyone is excited and looking for it because of the way that the price have declined dramatically in the years to go. Give us an indication of how much they've dropped over the last well, decade. Well, as an example, if you look at it, today's solar, uh, you can see the latest kilowatt per hour in Saudi was 2.3 cent. Wind was 2.1. Hmm. It's the first time in history that actually wind beats solar in a country like Saudi Arabia, where you would never think an oil-producing company would actually focus primarily on renewable. And they've set very ambitious target of nearly 57 gigawatt by 2030. That's huge if you look at it. And the reason that this have happened is two, three different things. The first one is innovation. Today, every OEM, GE is one of the leaders, every six months there is a new technology. A technology that's gonna help bring the price down. Today, if you look at it, we launched, as an example, a wind turbine that's a 5.5 megawatt. And the rotor diameter is 158. If I just put for you to, to imagine, it's exactly two 380 Airbuses next to each other. Mm. That's how big it is. And the reason it's bigger, because it's going to drive the price extremely down and generate at least 30% better efficiency, better electricity if you look at it. In addition, the second thing is new business models. You cannot, it's not a cookie cutter that you can, whatever you sell in Europe or the US would work in this part of the world. You need to change things and work on what would make it better. As an example, we mentioned the grid. Today, one of the major issues for all of the countries around the world is the grid. Today, if you want to inject as much renewable or as much gas, you need to have a reliable grid that will be able to take that. 
with all of the intermittency? And how can you actually introduce new business models that will allow you to overcome that challenge? And looking at it. And number three is the regulation. How open and flexible are the regulations that you're seeing around the world that will help you to actually introduce more renewable into looking at that? Chinese, as an example, China is one of the leading countries. They have nearly 60 gigawatt on an annual base, renewable. Mm. So they are leading that. Yes, coal is there because everyone's talking about base load. Until now, no one got the convention that renewable can be a base load. Everyone is telling you, well, I need gas or I need coal to make sure it's a base load. But with the new technologies together, renewable today can be a base load. As an example, if you do solar, take the best of the daytime, have solar and have wind together as a hybrid, you will take the best of the sun and the best of the wind, and that will have very minimal impact on the grid. In addition, you can add to that a bit of storage if yeah. needed to complement it. So that's a base load for you. The question today, solar is very competitive, wind is equally competitive, storage is still expensive. Mm. So if you wanna go and compete on the lowest cost of energy, that equation might not work 100%. Okay. The new winners in this uh, gas as a transition fuel, because a lot of people around the world, and I think it's part of our debate here, is a lot of people think, let's just switch, like the general population, let's go to solar and wind, and it solves all our <laughs> power needs around the world, which is not the reality. Uh, politically, uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Egypt as a net exporter now of gas, which is extraordinary in a four-year window, uh, Players like Abu Dhabi have discovered gas as well. Who wins in the geopolitical equation because of their gas supplies and production today? How much has it changed the game for Egypt in terms of its import bills, for example, that Manar was talking about? It's a huge game changer to your budget. Of course, actually, uh, cannot deny that the, uh, the gas, uh, when the latest gas discoveries in general has been the game changer for Egypt. And actually, I have to be, um, I mean, more pragmatic, it has been a game changer to the region, the East Mediterranean uh, region. To the extent that we sp started to speak about the East, uh, East Mediterranean Gas Forum, mm. we have now a cluster of countries where we need to uh, capitalize on this gas. Uh, the idea is not only uh, to have the gas for Egypt, or for Cyprus, or for any of the countries, but the you idea is- You can say is Israel as well, they're big. They're coming Israel on stream, yeah, of course. Or Lebanon. Uh, uh, what we need to do is to really uh, use this gas in order to be also not only for the welfare and the wealthy well-being of our people in our countries, but also to start being a reliable source of supply to Europe. And this is the strategy that, that these countries have. have so can I maybe interrupt you a second just exactly. for the, the, the point of our debate? Uh, and I posed this question to the former head of the KGB International Division last year. Uh, it was an off-the-record discussion, so let's put it on the record. Uh, do you worry about a, a war in the Eastern Mediterranean because Egypt's rising? We've seen what Turkey's been trying to do and poking around in the Cypriot waters and came into the Egyptian waters. They don't like this idea of Egypt rising this fast with this Eastern Mediterranean block. I don't imagine Russia likes it as well. So this is... The rise of these players counterbalances the dominance of Russia over Europe, does it not, uh, Dr. Sarkeesian? Well, I don't think that I'm going to comment what uh, your discussions were with the head of the KGB. <laughs> <laughs> Neither the... He was a uh, character like from the <laughs> 1950s, but he was pretty prescient with what so he had to I say. Think we're, uh, I, I would like more to speak about uh, 2020, 2030, 2050, rather than what happened before. And that brings me to the, to the same point. I think we are getting more diversified world, much more sort of a, a world which is much more dynamic. Uh, from that point of view, it becomes a bit more predictable. And at the end of the day, this brings us to more sort of predictable and stability at the end of the day. So I don't think that we have the same feeling of, or we're more afraid that will, that will be a big major political event or a war somewhere because we, we have learned how to balance it. Huh. Why is that, do you say? Because of the diversity, and at the end of the day, we're introducing more and more new technologies. In our discussions, there are two or three small elements, small ele ele elephants that are missing. The one elephant is, for example, the nu nuclear. Yes. I, I, don't, I don't know, is it politically correct to speak about nuclear of or course. not? <laughs> but at the end of the day... I had 40 minutes <laughs> left. I was going to bring it up, but that's okay. <laughs> bring it, you could, no, you could fast forward as a co-moderator today. So that, then, 
A nuclear mattress. Nuclear mattress at the end of the day, because we were from our, our past, or, uh, which was black, burning coal and fossil fuel, or from, from our sort of a grayish <laughs> sort of a presence today, when we are adding some green color to, to our current thing, I have the renewables, up to the absolutely green and beautiful future. I think we have to go years, years ahead. The question is, will nuclear be a part of that or not? Of course, I do understand, but people Sh have... Should it be, is your view? My personal view, it should be, because that will accelerate, because nobody has really calculated mathematically what is, what is the damage that we are doing by burning oil and, and coal to the planet, to the environment and the and, and, uh, climate. And that change in climate will have dramatic uh, dramatic impact on our... It will create tsunamis that will destroy destroy things like the Fukushima, for example. Human error that creates the, 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 the tragedy of Chernobyl. But at the end of it, as a technology with the new ones, well, 100 megawatt, 300 megawatt, small compact ones, I think the nuclear has, has a possible future. Because at the end of it, it do, doesn't... Do, do you have a caveat, Dr. Sarkeesian, with, with uh, where it's built, the technology that definitely, we have today? Definitely, that as, as every technology, it should be, it should be clear, international standards, but with the fourth industrial revolution or our evolution, what is happening now, introduction of things like artificial intelligence, that will make that. The second, I think, small element is we didn't speak about hydro mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And hydro matters. For many countries like Armenia, we have a very balanced energy portfolio. It starts with a, with a nuclear power plant. And that's a Soviet built BVR-430, which is, this is not an ultra-modern built by Arriva or so on. And it works steadily all of these years, even survives two big earthquakes and so on and so forth. So it's all about know-how and the future. Second, we have hydro. The third, we are pushing ahead with the renewables in Armenia as well. Yeah. And Armenia is exporting electricity. We're not exporting, we are not exporting gas because mm -hmm. we don't have gas, but we're exporting electricity. The third point that I would like to add to this discussion is water. Water as, as, as a natural resource. Okay, we have coal and oil here, but you have also water as a natural resource, which is very, very important. All of the countries that we're referring, they are very rich in natural resources. They are rich in sun, wind, oil. Not water. Yeah. But not water. Yeah. And water matters because, first of all, water in 50 or 100 years' time will be a source of energy when we'll learn how to, to have the, as a controlled uh, thermonuclear processes. Water will become not only for drinking, but also producing a lot of energy, that glass of water. Secondly, we, I consider Armenia as a part of the Middle East as well. Armenia doesn't have oil and gas. It has other natural resources, but it has huge resources of water. I mean, unfortunately, we probably are using around 10 or 20 percent of our water, and the other 80 percent is way wasted. So water is another, because a lot of your energy, be that renewable or burning, that's valuable thing, which is called oil. Oil is not for burning. I mean, we are, this is Middle Ages burning oil. Mm. It's so rich, natural resource. We can make food of it, we can make medicine of it, we can make anything, but we are burning it at the end of the day. Can I bring, it, bring a follow-up to you on this? So we see billions, as Menar knows, pa Patrick's seen it as well, billions of dollars going into downstream petrochemicals by uh, Adnoc in particular in, in Abu Dhabi. Saudi Aramco has de uh, declared their plans. And there seems to be a mental break, and, and Lee, if you want to jump in on this, is right. that the future is plastics. We hear it all the time. Oh, there's so much uh, demand for plastics in the future, and half the world seems to say that we need to be eliminating plastics because of the <laughs> yes. crisis. Where is the break? Is it going to be used for both or not? I know it's, it's a fairly complex question, but is there going to be that much demand for petrochemicals because of emerging market growth that they have this equation right? And Menar, please jump in after Dr. Sarkeesian. Well, I'll ask for some brevity because of time. Please. Well, yeah, I think it's all be bare. I, I've been wa watching this uh, thanks to World Economic Forum where I was for years chairing the Global Energy Security Council and watching all these predictions of how much oil is there in the world. First panic that the oil is getting, uh, there's no, no much oil uh, in, on this planet and we are, a lot of it are we going to use it or not. I think predictions are changing will be changing in five years or two years' time when you'll show me another graph, it will be different. Because there will be other contributions like technology, like uh, the change of the structure of our economy, uh, from, from the forward belt to startups, uh, smaller, local, and introducing things like artificial intelligence, big data management. That will help 
to manage the cities. That will help to minimize, optimize the way we are, mm -hmm. running, we are running our energy and resources as well. So it will be dramatic change. Let's meet in two years' time, and I would like to discuss with you the curves that you have presented here. So the world is changing very fast. And I think from that point of view, whatever we do in fossil fuel, oil, and connected it, I think we have to be looking uh, wider and have sort of a more inclusive, including, are we going to use the plastics yes. tomorrow? Or how much effect will have artificial intelligence all of our discussion tomorrow at the end of the okay, day? Okay, good. Um, Manar, why don't you jump in, and Patrick, feel free. Go yeah, ahead. absolutely. I agree with His Excellency 100% that you're going to see a major dramatic shift from what we presented today to what the picture is going to look in two, three, or five years from now on. Definitely most of the oil producers... Let me jump in, though, because, uh, you know, Minister Omoli was saying, I need predictability to attract a BP or any, any into your country to invest yes. in gas. So how do to, <laughs> to Dr. Sarkeesian's point, how do you plan for investment uh, so in the, hydrocarbons and, and the renewable space? Absolutely. So there is nothing today that replaces oil, but the fact is, are you using it in the value-add industries? So I think so they're going to be focusing today then just burning it or producing primary hydrocarbon and actually taking it through the value chain, focusing on industrialization and how can you actually introduce new industries and everything. So that will have a huge impact as it goes forward. The question is the predictability. Is it going to look the same today? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer today. I don't know what is it going to be in three years or five years. But the way that I look at it, today there is a major transformation across the entire energy sector. One of them is the raw material that you're actually producing. The way you're looking at it is completely different. Today, they're looking at it in four different segments, digitization, decarbonization, decentralization, and electrification. Each one of that, the actual the fossil fuels and the raw material play a major component. The question is, how are you going to be using it and to what extent? Okay, very good. So Go ahead, I think the answer to your Thanks. question is that, is that uh, yes, there's going to be a lot more uh, plastic produced and consumed because that is now an, an integral component of the quality of life that we expect across the planet. And as more people uh, come out of poverty and into the middle class and consume more of the things that we all take for granted, that is going to be a, an area of, of, uh, of consumption that is going to continue to increase and increase strongly. Yeah. So I would suggest you're not talking about single-use consumption, right? If absolutely. I mean, the, right. the problem with plastic is single-use and, and disposal and, and uh, fugitive plastics, if you like, because it's not the plastics that, uh, that, that uh, get recycled, it is the plastics that end up in the ocean that are causing, are causing the problem. So I think, yes, there's going to be a significant growth in plastic uh, consumption, but it has going to have to be uh, uh, renewable, uh, recyclable, uh, circular plastics. Could we talk about the, uh, the pervasive use or the tipping point of electric vehicles getting to four million, and when that happens, it really is a, a game changer. Yes. You can't have electrification without the natural gas, right? I would imagine as a Dana Gas, you must be satisfied with this. Well, uh, Minister Omola is probably well, pretty I, happy I, about this as I'm well. I'm going to air a pet peeve, which is, which is that electric vehicles are not the solution if you're, if you're really driven by climate change considerations. In fact, if, if anything, on balance, you have, to, you have to drive an electric vehicle over 100,000 kilometers for it to be carbon neutral. So uh, whilst 40% of the world's power generation is coming from coal, uh, driving an electric vehicle means you're driving essentially a coal-powered vehicle. If you're in, in China, that's an 80% coal-powered vehicle. If, uh, sorry, it's 60%. And if you're in India, it's an 80% coal-powered vehicle. That is not a sensible option uh, in terms of if, if your driver is really a reduction of, of, of CO2. What we need to do is to take CO2 out of the power generation mix. And, and that is, of course, to clean up power generation, either through substituting coal for gas or through renewables. Okay, good. Where do you fit into this value chain then, Lee? What are you telling your investors? Um, well, we're uh, working on an um, kite offshore kite-based energy system that uh, harnesses wind at altitude and converts it into dispatchable power. So we're ultimately solving two things, low-cost clean electrical energy and grid-scale energy storage. Um, I, I, you know, at the moment, I was because I was looking at the statistics uh, in terms of the global transition, not just the regional transition in the Middle East, and we still source um, around 87% globally of our energy from fossil fuels. Um, and yes, we've made some headway in the last 20 years, but I think it's going to be a massive, massive challenge. And I can't see that fossil fuels will be out of the picture for the next century. 
Like Centra, you yeah. sounds like you're reading the Saudi Arabian playbook. Then. Well, I, it's just it's it's very difficult to, to compete on cost um, uh, and also even in terms of the grid. What Manar was talking about uh, earlier that um, if you look at the total system cost, so it's not just simply generating electricity, but um, when you're delivering that variable, uh, if it's from renewables and you're delivering that variability to the grid, they've got to match frequencies and it's, it's, it's very, very complex and it adds to the total system, total cost of, of energy. So um, I think it has to be looked from that angle as well. Good. Yeah. Are we going to have that disruption that Dr. Sarkeesian was talking about though, if we have this conversation in five years time about the cost still coming down in renewables to compete uh, against the hydrocarbons? Well, today is at 2.1 cent. So the question is, how further can it go down? I think so it's going to reach into a point where it stands still. But you're going to see a complete different way of doing renewables. As an example, today, whenever you go and speak to any economy, everyone is telling you localization. And I agree with them 100%. That helped them diversify the economy, create jobs. But in five years' time, no one's going to speak of localization because you're going to do 3D printing on site. So the way you're going to be looking at it, do you really need the grid in five years? So there's going to be definitely a disruption, but it's going to be mainly driven by the innovation in that sector. Just to Dr. Sarkeesian's point, there's another pressure that's coming up, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it when you had to get your investors into Egypt. There's about $6 trillion of funds today that's saying they don't want their money invested in hydrocarbons. This is a challenge. It's been pervasive. You even have Norway, which is a major gas producer to Europe, with its sovereign fund moving away out of uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, you don't suffer the threat of stranded assets as a result of this global surge against the investment in hydrocarbons? No, I don't think so. Actually, uh, still, uh, the summary of what we said, that uh, oil and gas will still be there for some time. Mm. And this transition period, whether it will take 10 years, 20 years, uh, oil and gas will, sti will still be predominant. What happens is that we all think and we all believe that uh, renewal, renewables will be the end game, yes. But until such time, when we really develop our renewables to the extent that it could be really competitive and sustainable, I think that this is the time for oil and gas where by which uh, we need to, I mean, we are talking about the Middle East, including Armenia. We need to develop our countries. I mean, let us talk now more pragmatic. We are uh, still developing countries and we need a lot of funds. We need a lot of, uh, of things to be done to let our people feel this uh, resource or feel this uh, wealth or, or feel the uh, revenues of mm -hmm. uh, such thing. Uh, that's why, in my opinion, this is still a quick fix, uh, the oil and gas story. Uh, when the time comes where uh, renewables will really exceed and can overcome the oil and gas, by that time, we'll be in a position whereby our oil and gas uh, will be predominantly uh, focusing on added value supply chain, uh, uh, value uh, uh, industrialization. Sorry to be so blunt. Do we have that much time looking at the climate change agenda that we're trying to adhere to? Well, what happens, you know, you know I don't want to go into politics, but you know, there are sometimes people would say no and yes. So uh, we, at the end of the day, we are complying with the environment. We really do care about it, and we, we have to abide by the laws. But, but uh, uh, honestly, we have to think on how, I mean, I don't want to talk uh, very theoretic by no. saying where and to You have to be very practical today. We need to be practical. Our people are really in bad need of uh, resource, uh, electrification, oil and gas. We have major African, uh, in the major African uh, continent, there are a lot of poverty uh, in the Middle East as well. Uh, so we are still talking about food and bread. So uh, the luxury of, uh, is not now. So, uh, but what we are doing and with this uh, strategies, that's why, again, this refers to the first question. Do we really need to know where uh, the bracket of prices of oil and gas Yes, we need to know, mm. 65, 70, that's fine. So all countries will develop their strategy according to that. So if you go to any planning uh, ministry that would put the, 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 the budget for the country, they really need to know where the price uh, bracket of uh, oil and gas, 
by which they can. Because if you go to any uh, budget of any country, you would say, what, what, on what price we are going to put the Brent prices? Is it going to be 63, 65, 68, 70? And each dollar up and down can really uh, affect negatively your budget. Therefore, what we are talking about is really very important. Uh, advancement of technology and uh, research and development is very important. That's why it's getting down the costs of renewable, which is very good for us, for everybody. Until such time, we really need to capture quickly the uh, uh, earnings and revenues of the oil and gas and to capitalize on that. By the time when our friends are in a position to offset this uh, production by the renewables, we will by that time be ready with our industrialization for right. oil, oil and gas, where petrochemicals and whatever, uh, uh, as His Excellency the President said, it is a shame that we are just burning uh, oil. So, but we are not in a position now not to burn it. We don't have what consumes with an added value to oil and gas. So um, I think we are all aligned, but is, it is again it's the pace, which is coming first and what is the pace? There are uh, countries that are really more advanced and they are already developed countries. Uh, while countries like ours are developing countries, we are still need, we have need of time to recap and to close this gap. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, when we spoke about is it the gas and the oil, for us is a game changer and we need to quickly monetize this gas. And therefore, when we go to the original question, which is the major IOCs, are they interested? They are interested and they are coming to the region and the major, the big players. And I am saying then again that not coming for Egypt, but they are going, coming for the economies of scale they will have the East Mediterranean, the Middle East, they will have a foot everywhere so that they can uh, uh, have the economies of scale. There, therefore, we are still attractive, especially that we are all doing really reforms. So uh, uh, reforms, as you know, uh, uh, energy reforms, subsidy reforms, whatever, which is getting uh, more and more attractive. So you're saying the transition is being managed though by Egypt in your view. You had a quick yeah. comic then I wanted to take some input from the floor. Um, I, I definitely don't think there's any time left. Um, I, I think that the um, environmental crisis is probably one of the biggest threats um, that's ever faced humanity and the main cause is fossil fuels. Um, so I know it's, I, I could understand um, where you're coming from and saying yes I need to provide energy for my population, but the reality is um, if you use fossil fuels now, you're actually exacerbating um, the problem. Um, and I know it's very difficult to, 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 to yeah, reconcile. Should I, yeah, should I think about the climate or should I think about providing energy for my, which I know you said it's bread and butter that people need to live, they need to survive. Do we have the balance right, Patrick? Or not? Uh, no, and I, and I think <laughs> and I, I, um, I think we need to be very careful when we use the expression fossil fuels because there's not one kind of fossil fuels, there are different kind of fossil fuels. They all have different uh, energy components and, and characteristics when they get, uh, when they get combusted. Uh, let me just very briefly describe three different government policies that have had three different results. Uh, and you can judge for yourself which has been the most effective. In the United States, there's been a laissez-faire attitude towards uh, CO2. Uh, the Obama administration put some restrictions on, uh, on, on emissions controls, but essentially in the United States the CO2 production has gone down to levels uh, that, that were last seen in the 1970s because the cheapness of the shale gas has meant that power generators have gone away from coal and have gone into, uh, into, into gas burning. In the United Kingdom the result has been actually even more spectacular. A combination of emissions controls $20 a ton of CO2 uh, put, on the, uh, put on the emitters. Coal has practically disappeared from the energy mix in, in the UK. And the UK has now got 70% less CO2 production than 10 years ago. It's now at the lowest levels of CO2 production since the 1880s. Mm. In Germany, they've gone for a policy of a lot of uh, heavily subsidized uh, renewable energy combined with coal consumption for baseload power. And the result is that they have managed to 
reduce their CO2 production by at maximum 10% over the course mm. of the last 10 years. Well, they, they turned which, off the which is the most, power, right? Which is the most uh, you know, a, effective uh, a policy, do you think, uh, given simply the results? The UK has, has, has achieved that through a combination of renewables and gas. And, and policy. That, and, that, and, 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 and good policy making. Great. Was it a good call by uh, Angela Merkel to, to make the bold move out of nuclear? I mean, that's what the population wanted, but I don't think it actually worked out policy-wise. Uh, Dr. Sersegin? Well, I think you're you are, you are creating a discussion between one former physicist with another one. Angela Merkel was yeah. specialized in quantum uh, chemistry, and I was on quantum physics and uh, the theoretical <laughs> astrophysics. I think her approach, I think even in Germany, you go back another 20 years ago, the understanding of importance of nuclear was there. But big tragedies create, create um, so interpretation of a risk. And of course, today the nuclear has become some, something which, which people don't feel comfortable at all. Even in France with the decision in the last week as well. Yes, I do agree with that. But as we were, I think one of my conclusions here is that we do, do agree that if we don't have some dramatic changes or dramatic moves at the end of the, the, the path from getting rid of coal up to the complete renewable will be quite long. In the meantime, we will damage the environment and the, and the climate. And the damage that will, will create the damage to climate will not be just a passive damage. That passive that damage will be a dramatic one, creating more droughts, creating more problems with the food, with the less water, the more, more desert, deserts, and at the end of the day, no deserts, deserts. <laughs> and I think, and then we'll have more tsunamis in the world. So I think the choice is, do we try to find other solutions? And the solutions could be more uh, uh, hydro, more new technology based, like, the, like yours or something that I cannot predict today. More efficient, more optimized, using the new technologies. And that will, these technologies will grow very fast, using definitely big data management. I mean, I'm giving you small details, but they will become big tomorrow in the 21st century. And at the end of the day, we cannot just ignore nuclear because we're afraid of it. Good. Yeah, because uh, nuclear and because so banning... Two, two G7 countries now that have said, you know... Yeah, no. I, I do understand that. But uh, if you go back, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, a lot of European countries were excited by the idea and building more and more, including the United Kingdom. They have already lost the, the know-how by making a nuclear power plant, so they had to go to France, to Arriva and EDF, to make a nuclear power plant. So we don't want to end up in Europe at the end of it, except France. Everybody has lost, lost the techn nuclear technology. They have lost that. Italy, Germany, UK, and so on. So who has it? It has United States, Russia, Korea. I mean, the one which is in, in, in Emirates is Korean, and China. I think we don't want to use technology to lose technology which are important because they can be developed into something which is much more safer. So I think the right balance, and I agree with you, I think we don't have much time. Yeah. I think we have to be pushing, doing parallel processing, not just on having one second, let's fight against coal. I think let's fight against coal, let's use much more to better uh, gas and oil that reduce as, as quick as possible renewables. And let's not forget about, about hydro, but let's not forget about uh, nuclear energy, and use the maximum of the new technology, data management, optimization, because I agree with you, we don't have much time. Good. Let's take some questions from the floor. We have some microphones here. Does anybody else want to weigh in? Uh, we have one here. Good. Thanks. Is there anybody else we can get the microphones to you? Please. Thanks. If you can identify yourself, it'd be great as well. And I would ask for a very quick inter intervention. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Tina. I'm a global shaper from Cairo Hub. First of all, I would like to say that I'm very proud of uh, Dr. Monar and her representation of our industry and women in the industry. It's very inspirational for me. Uh, my question is um, the practices set about Europe, a policy, the policy pillar, and how phasing, phasing out coal and um, supporting renewables financials. How do you see um, the energy transition in terms of the policy pillar in our region? What, what, what do you think are the best practices for decentralization and democratization of the grid, spe specifically of that? Thank you very much for your question, and uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm proud to be here. Uh, I think so the, the region, I would say, to be frankly honest, is in the infancy stage when it comes to renewable. 
there is a lot of work to be done and it comes to the regulation, to the policies that will encourage the private sector to participate. It all starts with the right regulation. If you look at how did the countries have started, actually uh, most countries when they started the renewable, they started with a program that's called the feed-in tariff, which is a very rewarding uh, you know, program in terms of the payback. So everyone was excited, everyone had allocated the funding, the development, and they went directly through it. With time, this program has slowly actually declined, and after that you can see competitive bidding, which is on a larger scale to bring the price down. Some countries have been early movers, which is mainly the oil importers countries, Morocco in our region, Turkey as an example, Jordan. They've been one of the early movers because they were really hurt by the prices of oil. And some countries have very good say to do ratio. So if you look at it today as an example in onshore wind, you have nearly 11 gigawatt installed in the region. That's not small, that's quite good. But there is even more growth to go behind that. One of the major challenges that we're facing is the policies, is the regulation to encourage the private sector. There has been dramatic moves. Example, today you see most countries are speaking of private PPAs. Example, uh, Morocco have started, now Egypt have started this law, which will actually encourage them to move ahead with it, creating the right incentive mechanism to actually foster this energy, this uh, new transition in energy, and how do you look at it? But there is mainly policies have been actually, you know, I wouldn't say it's consistent. It's actually moving from one country to the other. People that have done the right policy, the say to do ratio was spot on. They said we're gonna have two gigawatt by 2018 or 2020, they've already achieved it. Others that had very ambitious target and didn't really do major reforms are still struggling. But in general, if I look at the region, it's quite exciting time. It's exciting time specifically for the transition of energy specifically in renewable. Uh, I'm seeing very good policies across the region now. Regulation are being reformed. Some questions on the bankability, because these projects are new, so there is still some more work to make it more mature and good bankability for these projects. Good. We have another question here. And if I can ask the team behind, and another question, there's a lot of questions coming up. Very good. Uh, there's another slide I want to get to as well, please. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Al-Harthi. I'm from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and I'm part of the Global Shapers Community of the World Economic Forum. Uh, my question again to you. Um, again, I'm very much proud of you as a Saudi woman and as a woman I'm in feeling, the energy I'm really sector. I'm really feeling discriminated <laughs> against you. Yes. Guys. Sorry. Um, me sorry. too. Me too. Me too. Um, in my well, research, he's in the room. We're we feeling yes, neglected. Support the guys here. <laughs> um, in my work, um, in my research in the renewable energy sector, I noticed that uh, the concentration is on solars. And um, my thesis is actually about uh, wind power plants in the GCC region in specific. Why do you think there is um, policies sh um, uh, focusing more on solars rather than um, integrating uh, wind, although we really have high potential in the region? Absolutely. Um, Thank you, Sarah. And, uh, Good. and Manar, yeah. and then have uh, Lee jump in. Absolutely. I should be quicker on the. Yeah. We had a hand up here as well. I just want to make sure there's a microphone here and here. Yeah. If we can get a microphone over so we can get these in, please. So thank you so much for the question. They started focusing on solar because it was much easier to implement, more cost effective, and you can have the plant ready in seven months. So it was a no brainer for a region that is in the infancy stage to focus on solar. However, if you focus on it from a capacity factor, which is an efficiency perspective, actually wind will produce double the amount of solar. So from a capacity factor, the investment is much more rewarding when it comes to wind but it takes a lot of time to develop the project. So in order to have a successful wind project, you need to have a wind measurement for 12 months. Solar, you don't need to have that. You can launch the RFP today, award it tomorrow. Seven months, you have it on the grid. The impact that no one is understanding is the impact of high amount of solar on the grid. Now, that's going to cause a major problem. Mm. because Exactly, because you're going to hit the grid with a huge amount of power, that if a cloud comes or the sun goes, bang, it goes mm. all the way down. Now that's gonna cause a major volatility to the grid. And unless you actually stabilize that with wind, as an example, to have this less impact, that's gonna be a major problem for all of the countries going forward. Good. But to your point, solar is gonna continue to grow and you know, significant growth. As an example, the region is gonna have, by 2050, I'm not gonna be here, but 39% of the energy is gonna be solar. 28% is going to be wind. So, 39% by 2050. Lee, any quick comment on that? Uh, no, I just, I know, because uh, I'm working offshore wind and I, it's still very, very expensive. I think um, IRENA 
it was about $120 per megawatt hour and installed, correct me if I'm wrong, because Mara's from that, um, I think it's around $3.3 million per, meg uh, yeah, per megawatt installed. And if you compare that to, for example, gas, um, is it around eight, $900,000 per mm. megawatt installed? Mm. So, yeah, I think it's ultimately cost. Um, I really do, onshore. Um, but also, like you said, the volatility uh, of renewables. Good. We had a question here. Yeah. Sorry, Patrick. Thank you very much. Yeah. My name is Sam Ajud. I'm the chairman of Jordan Wind. So I'm a living example of everything <laughs> that you said, ma'am. Uh, we actually developed um, the first and largest uh, onshore wind farm in, in our region, at least in, in, in the Middle East, 117 megawatt uh, wind farm, which went into commissioning in 2015. And I agree with you. Um, there has to be, the future has to be in hybrids, um, solar, wind, and hopefully uh, storage when, when um, storage prices and technology um, advance at the same pace um, that it has with, uh, with um, uh, wind and, and solar. Um, the other uh, point that you mentioned, again, uh, Jordan is a, is a pioneering country in that, and, and we've installed uh, many hundreds of, of um, thousands of megawatts now in solar and, um, and, and wind, and we all started with the feed-in tariff, and then we went into a bidding process. So um, I, I share with everybody the, the view that, uh, that um, if oil-producing countries now are, are looking towards having a 50-50 balance between renewables and, uh, and conventional, um, and, and non-oil producing countries like Jordan, we had to actually be innovative and be pioneers in doing that because when the price of oil hit the 120s and the 130s, we really had to go with that extra push. But as, as a wind developer and, and wind operator, I love wind and solar too. We developed solar, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a final question from the floor here. If we can get the microphone to that. Thank you. And we just have two minutes left. We can be uh, direct. Thanks. Hi, I'm Hashim Al Musawi, a global shaper from the Manamaha Bahrain and an employee of GE Power as well. Um, I would take the, the I would take the conversation to another direction, which is emissions. And thank you for bringing that up. Emissions controls. We talked about taking coal power plants out of the game, but what about the existing big fleet of gas power plants? Are we controlling them? Are we having the policies to reduce emissions from these? A lot of them are mature fleet, but we yet don't see from the MENA region a big focus on taking these emissions down. And we've seen countries like Iraq and Egypt going and reducing these emissions just because of funding and international organizations asking them to do that. But we don't see it coming from governments themselves unless it's for a purpose. Thank you. Great question. I'm going to let uh, Minister Mola and then Patrick finish up. Just to be direct because of timing, that's all. No, I think that this is part of what we were saying, that we are adopting this very stringent uh, uh, reduction of emissions. And uh, Egypt is a big country and we have big, of course, emissions that uh, is very clear. And we worked with the World Bank in order to uh, avail some funds, in order to have this program more uh, uh, rigid. And because some of the, the, uh, the fields where, that were producing these uh, emissions are really old fields and old plants and old refineries. And this is, again, a vicious circle that is being uh, inherited due to subsidies, fuel subsidies, whereby we spent all our money in fuel subsidies. Mm. We did not have the, uh, the, 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 the luxury of, uh, of uh, revamps and upgrading our refineries or our plants. So nevertheless, this is what we are undergoing now, and we are keen and serious about it. Plus, of course, uh, whatever we are undergoing now as a grassroots or new uh, projects are all adhering to uh, global environment uh, and standards. standards. Yeah, I understand your pain, though, because I was in Egypt not too long ago and saw you know, the cost of inflation, the cutting of the subsidies. It's exactly. a painful transition exactly. that most people don't uh, understand. It was one that was asked for by the IMF and the World Bank. But this is true. it's very, very painful on the uh, average citizen. We're seeing the same thing here uh, in Jordan. Patrick, final thoughts on uh, the emission I side? Th yeah, I think the final thought that I have is that if there's a single thing that we can do to achieve the COP21 goals is to put a price on carbon. I mean, we can, we can put uh, emissions uh, limitations in place. That's obviously desirable. But if there's a single effective policy that can really change the dynamic, it's to put a price on carbon and let the market decide what the most cost-effective way is of achieving those targets. I think being prescriptive, uh, generally, governments are not great about choosing winning technologies. So I think that putting, putting the price on carbon and letting the market itself decide what the most cost-effective way of getting there 
is, is going to be, and it can happen fast. Look what happened in the UK in the last uh, 10 years. Yeah. So what, in 10 seconds, what holds that back, Patrick? Is it just not a global policy for that, despite Vested all this? interests. Yes, okay. Good, that answers the question. We'll, we'll take that one off grid. It's hard to be so cute about it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Teresa Hartman for putting together such a diverse group. Uh, Mr. President, good to see you again. I saw you, uh, it's been, I think, five years, actually, see you face to face. Uh, Minister, it's always a pleasure. Good to see you. I look forward to going back to Egypt. And again, uh, the contributions from all three of you from the industry was uh, fantastic. Nice round of applause for our panel. Thank you.